Yesterday we were discussing certain MPI calls. So we talked about MPI send and MPI receive, right? Now let's have a slightly deeper look into what happens when you make these calls, right? So when you make an MPI send call, what actually happens? So this is the application space and in the application space, you've allocated some buffer, right? And you want to send the contents of this buffer. So you call MPI send. Then there is the interconnection network. There is some network interface. How do these network interfaces work or the drivers for these work? So typically there are some queues that they maintain, right? Corresponding to different links that are connected to the network interface and they queue up the data that you want to send, right? So there'll be these queues, they'll keep getting filled up and slowly at the link transmission rate, it will keep putting this data onto the network, right? The rate at which this queue gets empty is driven by the bandwidth, right? The bandwidth of the link. Okay. Now, what may happen is that when you do an MPI send, maybe the size of the data you have is very, very large, right? It may be say hundreds of MB. That's quite common actually. Okay. If you're looking at very large simulations, the amount of data you transfer is very, very large. So if you're transferring hundreds of MBs of data, right? So you call an MPI send and your buffer is of size some 100 MBs. What's going to happen? It's going to try to fill these queues and these queues also have limited space. So sometimes these queues get full. Okay. And when these queues get full, what happens? Well, you still have data residing over here. Some of the data has been copied over here, but you don't have enough space to copy all the data, right? So what's going to happen in this case? Well, MPI send is a blocking call. So it's going to block. What that means is that the control won't come back to the user. So the control will stay with MPI. It's going to keep waiting for some of the data to get into the network. And as it gets pushed out, it's going to insert more data into the queue, right? And it's going to keep on doing that until this buffer has completely been emptied out, right? All the contents have been copied to the queue. Okay. So what's the main issue? The main issue is that this buffer is not reusable. The application should not be reusing this buffer, right? Because it hasn't copied the contents out. And because of that, it's not returning back to the user. Well, you may have other stuff to do, right? You may have other computations to do, other things to take care of. So in order to do that, what is supported is non-blocking calls. So what are non-blocking calls? So similar to MPI send, you have a call MPI I send. Right? So this is for non-blocking. We'll talk about the arguments in a while. But essentially what this does is that the moment you call MPI send, it's going to immediately return back. Okay? But you cannot reuse the buffer. Even though the control is back with the application, the application is not allowed to touch the contents of this buffer. Right? Because they are still being copied out. Okay? So now what will happen is that there is a call called MPI test, right? We'll again talk about the arguments, but essentially this allows you to keep on checking regularly whether the buffer has now been completely copied into the system queues or not. Okay. And once you get the indication from MPI test that it has been copied out, then you can go ahead and reuse the buffer until then you cannot reuse the buffer. Okay, you can do other stuff, you can do other computations, other things that you want to do, but you cannot touch this buffer. That's, that's about it. So that's quite useful. At the end of the day, you want to overlap the computation with the communication, right? You want to save time. So you want to overlap these two. So it helps you to do computations while data is still being copied out. Okay. So here we spoke about, you know, the system buffers, you need to copy the buffers out and it takes time to copy the buffers out because the system buffers get full. So therefore you want to return back to the user so that you can do useful computation. Another reason for wanting to use non-blocking calls is that in a lot of situations, right, you don't know when you're going to receive data, right? So for instance, typically in master slave kind of 
settings. Maybe the master is doing some work. The master basically coordinates the effort amongst all the slaves. So it will give it some work to do, right? And when this work is done, this slave is going to respond back. So now you may not know exactly when this work is going to get over, right? It may depend on a lot of factors. So what does the master do in this case? Well, if the master is going to post an MPI receive, what's going to happen? It's going to block. It's going to keep on waiting for one of the slaves to come back, right? It can say MPI source any, so it will wait for any of them to come back, but still, you know, none of them may be coming back for a long time. And for that entire time, the master is basically stuck doing nothing, right? So again, the master may want to, you know, do some computations, do its own work while the slaves are still doing their work. Right? So again, in this setting, what would the master do? It would, instead of calling MPI receive, you will call MPI I receive. Right? So this is the other setting where you will use non-blocking calls, where you don't know exactly when you are going to get the messages. Okay, so let's have a look at what these calls look like. Let's understand these calls and then we'll go through an example, right? Okay, so the first call is MPI I send. and this takes as parameters the pointer to the buffer, count of the data to be transferred. So it's quite similar to MPI send, right? Data type, destination, the tag, the communicator and there's one other important parameter. This is the new parameter. It's called the request. And this request is of type MPI request. So you pass an address of a request variable. And what it's going to do is it's going to basically fill it up with some identifier. When it wants to know the status of whether this non-blocking call has completed or not, it needs to say which call I'm talking about, right? So this request is essentially used for that. All right. Similar to receive, there's an MPI I receive call. And what this does is again, you have a buffer count data type source in this case, tag communicator and request. Again, source can be MPI any source and tag can be MPI any tag. Yes. So it will keep, it, it's a blocking call. So until it doesn't find some data that matches this request, it's not going to return back to the application. Right? That's the whole point of using IDC. That's what we spoke about over here, right? The master slave scenario. So the slaves are working. Now, if the master posts a MPI receive, right? And suppose the slaves are still working and they don't have anything to send back, then it's going to get stuck. It's going to keep on waiting. Okay. Okay, then you have this call MPI test. What does this do? So it takes a request as parameter, the address of a request and a flag, pointer to a flag. This is nothing but basically an integer. So it's a pointer to an integer and status, right? So the status is of type MPI status as we discussed last time. Okay, so request is nothing but the call that it wants to figure out whether that has completed or not, right? So this is the same request as you passed in MPI I receive or I send. So whatever is returned in that, you have to pass that same value over here to MPI test, right? So it knows that this is the call you're talking about and you're checking whether this call has completed or not. Now it checks whether this call has completed and if it has completed, it returns flag equal to one. It sets flag to one, otherwise flag will be set to zero. Okay. So flag basically tells you whether this operation is completed or not. And then you can go and query the status, right, as before. All right. So then there are different variants of test. So this you can go and read in detail if you want, right? So we won't really be using a lot of these in examples, but still you should just know about it. So you can go and read the specification. I'll give you a pointer to the specification. 
there are lots of variants of tests and weight, so we will not be going through details of all of them. But just to give you an idea of a couple of them, so there is MPI test any. So you may post multiple non-blocking calls, right? So you may post multiple I receives or I sends or multiple I sends and I receives together. And now you want to basically figure out if any of them has completed. Maybe you are communicating with four different processes and if any of them completes, you want to basically tell it that, okay, I want to give you more work or something of that sort, right? So MPI test any, you specify the count. The count is the number of calls that you are talking about, right? And then you pass an array of requests. So earlier we were talking about a request, now it is an array of requests, okay? So count is the number of elements in the array, the number of requests you are talking about, right? As simple as that. And then there is a pointer to an integer which is the index flag status as before, okay? So what happens with MPA test any is that you have passed it an array of requests. So if any of them completes, it is going to set flag to 1. Okay. And if flag is 1, then you can look up the index and the status. Then they hold valid values, right? So index tells you in that array which index, which particular request has completed, right? It gives you the index in the array and status as before, right? So if multiple requests have completed, then it only returns one at a time, okay? So test any will not tell you completion of more than one at a time. Okay, so anyways, you know, when you program and, and if you come across scenarios where you have to use test any, you can always look up the MPI reference, right? Another important call is MPI wait. This is again quite simple. So it takes as argument uh, request and status. And what is this? This is the request for the non-blocking call. And the status is basically once that call completes, it's going to return back. So this is again a blocking call. This is not a non-blocking call, but it's a blocking call which waits for a non-blocking call to complete, right? So it's essentially similar to MPI test except for it won't return back, right? It will come back only when the call actually completes. So typically what happens in programs is you, you are doing some non-blocking calls and then at the end of the program, you are pretty much done and you have to wait for all the non-blocking calls to complete, right? So at that time, you just post MPI wait. Right? And, and wait for those non-blocking calls to complete. Because you have no more computations to do, you have no more overlapped work to do, so you just post an MPI wait. There is again another variant MPI wait all, right? This takes as argument count, array of requests, and array of status. So it's again similar to MPI wait except for it waits for all the calls to complete. So you can post MPI wait all for a number of non-blocking calls and it, it will simply block until all of them complete, right? And the status will be returned back for all of them. Okay, and similarly you have calls like MPI test all and you have MPI wait any and so on, right? So we'll not talk about them. They're pretty similar to these calls.